the guest today is um, is David Tuchier, who is a Swedish sociologist of religion, whose latest book, Granskogsvark, The People of the Pine Forest, utilizes a remarkable range of resources from poetry and history and interviews with contemporary urban Swedes to explore the ways in which the forests and the mountains of Sweden and nature more generally have become the essential source of spiritual refreshment for, for the people who live there. Um, this, is a, this is a remarkable turnaround because the wilderness used to be an alien space where death was a constant threat, and I'm not exaggerating, and it's been transformed into a kind of safe theater of experience, a frame through which we can safely contemplate ourselves and our deaths the meaning of our lives and their significance or lack of it. Um, David, can you explain how you came to study this? Um, thank you for, for having me here. So my background is that I'm a historian of religion and I come from originally from Islamic and Pentecostal studies. I've been studying small, strongly religious minorities in Sweden and elsewhere. And studying those minority groups sort of led me to see something about the majority culture in, in Sweden, which is my own country. Uh, and to sort of, I've always experienced the majority culture, of course, to be the normal and sort of the point of departure of, of everything. And that is also the way most Swedes think of it. But I suddenly saw it in all its strangeness when I sort of beheld it from, from the outside by taking this Muslim or Pentecostal uh, perspective on it. So I then started to study, um, study major the strange majority culture of the Swedes. Uh, and what, what's particular for that culture is that when it comes to religion is that it is in one sense, the world's most secular country. If you ask people in Sweden in surveys, uh, do you think that children should take or should, should learn about the religious tradition of their parents? A vast majority says no, they should not learn about it. They should, they should be independent, they should discover their own uh, way in life, and they should not be imposed with any kind of uh, traditions or uh, religions of any sorts. 85% uh, in some surveys uh, say that religion has no meaning whatsoever in their lives. Uh, Sweden holds the world record in denial of uh, the existence of God if you ask the question to believe that there exists a God. So at the first glance, this can, may very well seem as one of the most secular, non-religious, de-Christian countries in the world. Uh, there are some other, uh, Estonia, Czech Republic have similar scores on these kind of questions. But if you look deeper into the same question and, and sort of investigate it further, it's also apparent that uh, it is not as clear or simple as one might think. So let me give you an example. If you ask people in a survey, do you believe that God exists? You would have about 15% saying yes to that. But if you instead ask just simply, do you believe in God? You will have 40% answering yes to that. And uh, if you ask, do you believe in a higher spirit or life force? you would have percentages on about uh, uh, 4, 45%. So if you add this together, you would get almost 70% believing either in God or in a higher spirit of love for, or, or life force. So if you ask differently, almost all of them are believers. Uh, and okay, I can give you another example. Uh, people say that they have no connection to religion, but if you look in how they, where they place their money, we have a vast majority of Swedes who actually are uh, paying uh, members of uh, religious communities, paying their annual fee, uh, which is the equivalent of a hun several hundred euros every year to become to be members of a, of a religious, or religious organization. So there's this complete paradoxical and confusing situation. And this sort of led me to inquire into the development of Swedish secularization uh, by making interviews and by going back to the historical sources and to follow the development of this uh, uh, alleged secularization. And what you can see then, or what I have sort of discovered, is that very much of it has to do 
uh, with sort of a self-image. So there's a self-image connected to secularization. It's the image of religion uh, uh, that it being something that we don't have, but that others have. So a part of the secularization can be explained by the fact that the meaning of religion, or more precisely, the meaning of what it means to be Christian has changed in Sweden. So this is a, a very important sort of find. Uh, because if you ask people, are you, okay, to put it simply, if you ask people, are you a Christian? 100 years ago, everyone would say yes. Now, very few would say yes. Put it, uh, I, I'll make it a bit simplified here. Uh, and this is partly because they are less believing, less church going and so on now than they used to be. But it, but it is also because the word Christian and the meaning of being religious has changed in the language. Uh, so a hundred years ago, and if you read older Swedish literature, you will find that the word Christian is used as sort of uh, a name for we, uh, all, we the friendly people here who are decent people, who celebrate Christmas, baptize our kids, and we are generally friendly people. It's like the us, the denominator for the, for the group. We are the Christians. So they would speak uh, in old, older literature, it will be written things like, uh, well, any good Christian knows that you should uh, not steal or you should be a good person. To be a good person is to be a Christian. Well, during the course of the 20th century, this changed so that Christian became a denominator for those who are intensely religious. Uh, Pentecostals, for instance, and uh, it became a denominate, a sort of a, a name for others. Others are religious. Can I can I stop there? Stop you there for a moment, because was this change driven from inside the church or outside the church? Was it uh, Christians who said you're not a real Christian unless you're really hardcore, or was it the outside world? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was driven uh, in many ways, also from inside the church. It was the result of the high church movement in one sense, which sort of wanted to sharpen the, the criteria to be called Christian from inside the church. But it was also driven by this alliance, discursive alliance, you might say, between revivalist Christians, predominantly Pentecostals, and uh, secular atheist critics of religion. Um, I'm sorry if it gets a bit complicated, but the thing is, uh, so let me put it like this. Uh, from Because we have to remember that the background in Sweden is this state church Lutheranism. So it's a country which used to have a state church, which was Lutheran. And the Lutheran idea of what it meant to be a part of the Lutheran Christian family was that you should be a hard worker, hardworking, decent citizen. Uh, you should uh, have the, the Christian culture as sort of a framework for your life. It would frame you, you would be baptized, and you would be buried in the church, and you would marry in church. It would be, it would be there like a ritual framework. It was not a tradition that said that you should go to church all the time. You didn't have to go to church all the time. Now, if you measure how many people go to church in Sweden, there are about 2 or 3% on an average Sunday. A hundred years ago, and this is surprising to many Swedes because they think they are so freshly secularized. A hundred years ago, about 5% <laughs> went to church on an average Sunday. So that, and we have also had massive uh, immigration to Sweden. Uh, so we have almost 25% of the population who are uh, immigrants who, and don't have this tradition from the Swedish church. And if you remove that part of the population, we have a very even uh, level of church going, which is extremely low, but it's even. So it's probably been like uh, in such a way that since the Reformation, the Swedes have not been particularly church attending ever. Um, but there's this idea that we have ceased to go to church. This, this is something that we stopped recently. So there's this um, confusion there. And what the big picture then is that being Lutheran, being a state church, normal Lutheran Swede, uh, is about the same now as it used to be, which means that it means that you, you pay your, your membership fee. Uh, you have the church as a ritual framework. You are a law-abiding citizen, and you try to be decent in your life, and you, you trust the grace of God. Something like this. You have a vague belief. 
you, uh, state church Lutheranism is not a dogmatic form of religion. It's not an intense maximalist form of Christianity either. It's is sort of um, kind of tradition that is very unintense, perhaps you could say. But the thing, what has happened in the Swedish language and the Swedish culture is that that type of religion, that religion of the Swedish history is not deemed to be religious anymore. It is felt to be something else than religion. If you ask someone who is, so, so the, the common thing in Sweden, and this is like the, the mainstream, is to be baptized, to be confirmed in the church, to be married in the church, to have a Christian name, to, be, to celebrate Christmas, to celebrate Easter, uh, to believe in some kind of vague uh, higher power or something, and to be a paying member of, an, of a, a Christian church, while at the same time feel that it would be absurd to call oneself a Christian. <laughs> because being Christian is something that the others are. And now this, of course, connects to my background in Islamic studies, because let's say a group of, of Swedish, po I call them post-Christians, so people belonging to this group, doing all these Christian things, but denying any connection to religion, if they were sit together and there would be a Muslim, let's say a Pakistani woman coming into a room, uh, having a Muslim name, celebrating Muslim uh, holidays, eating Muslim food and giving her name, her children Muslim names, for instance. Uh, they, this group, these post-Lutherans would immediately recognize her to be a Muslim. She would be a representative of, of her religion. This would be an Islamic person. Why does she wear these clothes? Because she's Muslim. Why is her son's name Muhammad? Because they are Muslims, of course. But then when you look at themselves, they would not recognize their sort of Lutheran Christianity as an instance of religion. Uh, they would think of themselves as secular. And this creates this sort of identity uh, confusion, especially in the interaction with other religious communities. David, do you think this is more widespread? This pattern is more widespread, or is it particular to Scandinavia? No, um, I think the same is definitely true for all um, uh, all the Scandinavian, all the countries which used to have a Lutheran state church. Okay. I think it's connected to that type of tradition. So Norway and Denmark and Finland and Estonia would really fall into this pattern as well, and perhaps also the UK, because in in uh, there are many similarities, as you know, between our religious histories. Now, when you, um, when you, in your, in your, in the latest book, you're talking about what people get from being in nature. It's not just looking at it, it's being out there, walking there. And what strikes me is that it is so much like what people in other countries get from going to churches and cathedrals, perhaps, particularly. If I can quote, um, a piece of uh, something that you've written. You said, for the people I've talked to, the consolation of the forest is not a promise of change or improvement, nor is it a hope of life after death or a promise of relief from pain. The consolation, if I understand them, lies in the quiet reassurance that life is as it is, that all that's busy being born and everything that's busy dying are bound together in an indivisible symbiosis and that we, as biological creatures, are a part of this whole. That's how it is for plants and animals, and that's how it is for us too. And this kind of reconciliation with the world seems to me deeply religious. It seems to me something that Christians get out of going to church. Is that fair? And why do people get it from the forests and not from the churches? Yeah, because, because what happens with this, uh, this sort of language situation where, where you don't have a name for your own religious identity okay. uh, creates this numb or uh, what do you call it? This, this silence. It sort of shrouds everything that has to do with religiosity, religious experience, uh, connection to your own tradition in some kind of silence. You cannot talk about it. You cannot name yourself as religious. I, I, I will come to your question, but... I interviewed one lady and she told me she was sitting in this uh, in, in her workplace and they had a coffee break and people would start discussing religion. And then the, there were like two 
uh, articulable is that a word uh, articulable uh, positions so one guy from her office would say i'm an atheist okay and everyone knows what an atheist is like well they're atheists they don't believe in god and they're like that and then another one would say well i'm a christian but he was a syrian orthodox immigrant from turkey so they have sort of a strong they have a big golden cross and they're christians and everything is sort of uh, clear what, what that stands for and then this woman says that when this discussion came there was no word for her to express what she herself was so, so she said she would just look deep into her coffee cup like this and just wait for this discussion to blow over because what is she she could not say i'm a christian because that would sound as if she was like this uh, orthodox guy or some pentecostal some religious crazy thing that she could not identify with but she could not really say that she was an atheist either because she is after all you know believing in something and part of that culture there's no name for it this is a nameless identity and when there is when the identity is nameless and this religious position whatever it is also doesn't have a name or a language well then you have to be quiet about it so you need silence uh, so they explore it and they feel it in silence and the best place to go for silence is the forest uh, so this, if you have to, be, if you want to explore this kind of nameless spirituality, you have to do it on your own, and you have to do it someplace uh, which is not sort of packed with symbols and connotations and unscientific uh, or embarrassing things that you cannot uh, deal with. So that's one explanation. But then, of course, there is an older tradition of nature romanticism and uh, nature love which has a very long history uh, and also a very prominent sort of uh, recent history in Swedish society. Yes, you, you touched a bit on the, on the, on the older tradition um, and the fact that the, the, the ethnic Swedes and their ancestors have been living in forests for about 5,000 years, as far as we know. And this is bound to influence your, your attitude towards them. I can't say I found that completely convincing because my ancestors have not lived in forests for a very long time. But when I go to Sweden, I feel exactly what your people describe. Um, I know it completely. I, I love being in the forests. They are to me a, a, a place of intense refreshment. I get all the feelings that your people describe. And so what are the other possible explanations why somebody should feel like that? It can't really be that I'm a kind of deeply spiritual person. What, what are the other conditions of life? That make one, one of the explanations, well, I mean, I believe that, uh, that there is sometimes a tendency among historians to place all modern phenomena, the origin of all things that we have in the 19th century, like in everything was founded in the 19th century and there was nothing before it. And sometimes one can go too far in that type of explanation. So that's why I also wanted to have the deeper historical layers there as, as part, part explanations at least. But of course, one of the main explanations why people seek their spirituality and emotional sort of uh, the, the arena for that type, uh, that aspect of life in nature is related to this dichotomy between uh, the, the city and the forest that was de developed with uh, industrialization and modernization. Because with the sort of advent of the modern, uh, modern times where Sweden and all, all the other neighboring countries as well were strongly industrialized and quite quickly uh, with the uh, cities growing and today it's a very urban country 85 percent of swedes are living in cities so it's a quite urban country despite its huge forest so this dichotomy was created this this dualism where you have on the one hand the city with all the modern things with rationality and industrial mindset and all this professionalized and specialized things belonging to the modern secular world and that this was sort of contrasted in culture and in people's lives with the other uh, side, which was associated to leisure and uh, free time and the countryside, the countryside which one had left. And you could say that all the things that did not fit in the modern secular 
society, they were sort of left in that other domain. And this is also particularly clear with the uh, dichotomization between uh, working time and leisure, which is sort of a something that structures the life, the time and life of everyone since industrialization. So that means that in Sweden, people would work in the city and then when the summer came, they would you know, change their clothes and they would go to their cottage in the countryside. And this means that all the things that didn't fit in modernity, things like emotions, uh, traditions, uh, feelings, uh, laughter and dancing and you know, all this kind of stuff, Yes. had to be sort of pushed into that rural, yeah. old traditional domain. And this also meant that religion and religious feelings and this deeper existential connection to, to the universe, which was something that really didn't fit in the modern rational society, it also had to be left there and felt there. Um, and this, so this means that if you want to feel that kind of feelings in a modernist country like Sweden. Well, then you have to do it there. Um. Yes, this does seem to be slightly different in, in, from the situation in this country. Partly, we've, we had some research earlier showing that in the, in the lockdown, in the pandemic, people were much more interested in in nature, so to say, and they, they were coming out. But there's not, um, for one thing, there's a very high proportion of Swedes who actually have little places to got in the countryside. Um, traditionally, everybody had a little cottage in the woods somewhere. Yeah. And um, that's quite absent in this country where the, where the valence of, of living in the countryside is completely different. Um, you're meant to own a very large chunk of it really, and have a second house yeah. in London. Um, but it's also connected to the fact that, and I think this is maybe some uh, thing where UK and Scandinavia differ, that uh, Scandinavian countries are, and especially Sweden and Norway and Finland, I suppose, uh, also Finland, we, we are um, quite young as urban cultures. I mean, even me, I'm, I'm born in the 70s, mm -hmm. and now when September comes, even I feel that I mustn't miss, I mustn't miss out on picking the mushrooms, uh, because it's, it's our duty to take care of the food <laughs> that sort of the forest gives us. And this is uh, a remnant of this old self-sustaining uh, society where everyone just lived out of the forest. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're a recent uh, urban culture, the young urban culture, compared to in France, people have been talk, sitting in cafes discussing for 2000 years. In Sweden, we have been discussing in cafes in 20 years, and it's a, or maybe a hundred. So that also makes a difference. Less, less if the coffee is any good. Um, <laughs> but how does, it, how does it compare with America? That does strike me that large parts of the American flyover country are much more like Scandinavia than they are like England. Yeah, but I mean, there is, I think sociologically, uh, there is a connection, sort of cultural connection between this North Atlantic, I mean, nor, nor, Northern, uh, Northeastern uh, uh, America and uh, Northern Europe, uh, Netherlands, Northern Germany, Scandinavia, UK, there is some kind of cultural, um, connection and in terms of values and worldview and lifestyle and so on in all these countries. Um, but one thing that is striking also, and this I'm not sure, maybe it's in America as well, I, I'm not really sure about that, but in my uh, interviews that I've done with forest visitors, uh, they do not speak so much about uh, things like awe or this sublime feeling of being oh, blown away by by a starry sky or something like this, which is something that you would expect from nature, uh, spirituality, if you read what's been written in art history and so on, where, where this sort of the, the experience of the sublime is very present. And if you look at what has been written about American, by American scholars and sociologists about this type of experiences, that the peak experience is a very present thing. In our interviews, uh, in, in this project and my interviews, this is not 
uh, at all a big theme. Instead, it's like the forest as a, as a caring, homely, safe place. That is the, the most common understanding. They feel a sense of homeliness, a sense of being taken care of by the trees, the trees as friendly creatures hugging them, you know, this kind of feeling. So that might be a difference in relation to other countries as well. Okay, um, just as a piece of radio style branding, I point out here that we're talking to Professor David Turfiel, the Sertorn University <coughs> in Stockholm about his work on Swedish religiosity, and in particular, the way in which nature has taken the place uh, that churches or indeed the idea of God um, still have to a larger extent in most of the Western world. Um, one, of the, one of the other obvious points of difference is, uh, well, how, how do the feelings that you describe um, relate to the sort of new age fashions in, in contemporary Britain and America? Um. When I started out in this, uh, this project and writing this book, I anticipated there to be a stronger sort of dichotomy between Christianity, Christian spirituality, and this nature spirituality. Uh, I've, and, and that sort of the nature spirituality would be more connected to sort of neo-pagan or, or new age kind of uh, discourses. Um, I found that they are could be that sometimes, but they are also quite strongly connected to uh, to Christian uh, Christian spirituality. And those who are most nature spiritual, if you want to use that word, in Sweden, are those who are also uh, Christians, believing Christians. And this is true for the state uh, former state church, the Lutheran Church, where I mean. Even the bishops in, and the, the official theology and the, um, the way the altarpieces are designed and the way they uh, practice pilgrimage uh, visits to nature and all kinds of practices and beliefs and, and the, the understanding of clergymen and clergy women. Uh, that it's very, has a very sort of prominent turn towards nature spirituality in the Christ, as a part of the Christian religion. And you can also find it outside, but also not only the state church, but also Pentecostals, for instance, and other uh, Christian denominations that I would not have expected to find this trait in. So it is not really something that uh, is sort of an alternative to Christianity in, in that sense. It, it's there as a part, general part of the culture, both within and without uh, Christian religion. And there is a connection to new age and that type of things, but um, actually it's not so prominent as I had expected. Uh, we actually have a, um, <coughs> a minister of the Swedish State Church in on this Zoom call. Um, Christina, do you have any comments on all this? If I can unmute you, if you can unmute yourself, I don't know, this technology defeats me. Hello? Can you unmute yourself? I think so. Thank uh -huh. you very much. It's really interesting to hear and I'm sitting and yes, I agree to everything because I'm a priest. I live in Värmland, uh, born in Småland and nature is essential for me. Uh, and as a priest, I use a lot of poems and because I, I just started to read the, your book. Uh, many of the poets you define to, I used to read them on funerals and I have this, you know, nature is extremely important and uh, so I completely agree. It doesn't have to be a either or church, Christian church or, or forest. I mean, I, we go out in the forest and like you said, the pilgrimages and, and so, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't see. Uh, I don't see it's uh, opposing force, or uh, so I, I, I think I bring the nature too. Uh, I add it to. I mean, in in many hymns and uh, uh, yeah, okay, 
there are, I mean, there are allusions to to Christian messages and like you you wrote about the poem in Södergran, for example, and lots of them, <clears throat> Fröding, Lagerlöf. <laughs> yeah. um, it's omnipresent, this nature, romanticism in, in poetry. But one thing that is, and I agree, it's not uh, opposed to Christianity, but Christianity, uh, Swedish Christianity is also changing with the trends in, in society as a whole. And one of the things, if you compare the teachings of the church, uh, the earlier teachings of the church, and this I think is a more, I'm in Denmark now, and I know that the Church of Denmark has a theology which is more, uh, less nature oriented, I think, than the Church of Sweden, and perhaps more in line with what it used to be also in the Church of Sweden. And for instance, there, if you look at the role nature has in, in, the, in the teachings, it is always sort of pointing to the, the divine reality that is beyond it. So we have a famous Swedish song that everyone knows because it's usually sung and at this when the sc uh, school um, uh, when, when schools are out for the summer. So uh, then we usually sing the song and it says like this that the nature, uh, the beauty of nature reminds us uh, of the uh, the goodness of God. So the nature is, and this is the trope, the sort of the motif that comes again and again and again in the classical uh, Swedish hymns. Uh, that uh, nature is there, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and we like it. Uh, and it's there as a pedagogical tool for God to point at eternity. Uh, and this, of course, is a different type of nature than the type of nature understanding that is now coming in the general ecological, sort of deep ecological movement where there are uh, pol political movements for the rights of nature and against uh, climate change and all these things, where there is a strong emphasis that nature and the other species and the ecological systems have sort of a right in their own. They're not just there as uh, to be utilized by us, but they have their own rights. This is an ecological turn that starts to stress that kind of idea. And that is also now coming into the Church of Sweden. So there is a um, uh, one uh, sort of uh, a, a text written by the bishops or the community of bishops, which declares that this is also the view of the Church of Sweden, this deep ecological understanding of the right of all things living and so on. So that type of political changes also come into the theological teachings of this church. How does this compare with the with the kind of thing that Pope Francis has been doing? Because yes. you know. it's similar, it's similar. And there's also World Council of Churches have also written something uh, along those lines. So this is something that happens in many denominations, obviously. But it changes. It is although maybe the the church might think of this as a continuity throughout the centuries, but it is actually quite a shift, quite a shift from how nature used to be described and and portrayed in previous generations of, of theologians. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get around the, the, the word for anchoring here. Um, how, one has the sense, at least in this country, that a lot of this activity is coming from the clergy down towards the congregations, uh, whereas in some of the congregations, in some of the Scandinavian countries, it's coming up from the congregations and seeping up from the culture into the church. Um, is this fair? Because an awful lot, surely, about our, our responses to the, to the great ecological crisis hangs on how much people will sign up for them, how much they are not just driven by, as it were, guardian readers, but taken in by 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 everybody, by by ordinary non-political people. Yeah. The, the Church of Sweden is a democratic church, uh, and this means that the church will teach what its members believe to be right. And from many other church traditions, this can be um, um, sort of strange because you you think of. Uh, religion as God revealing something and then sort of the, the religious authorities teaching it to the people. But this is uh, the Lutheran idea of common priesthood, which means that the Holy Spirit in that idea speaks to uh, 
his flock to the humans through their uh, hearts. And the, the voice of God is spoken in the heart of each and every one. So if you want to know what God wants with the body of people, they each have to say what they feel to be right. So they have to vote. Uh, so this means there's sort of a theological legitimization of uh, a democratic system, which is a strength, if you like, democracy. It's sort of a theological argument for, for a democratic system. It is also a weakness uh, if you are afraid that the, the ideas of the people can go in all kinds of directions. So if, if let's say, Sweden would be, uh, uh, the, the people would be fascist or turn into a fascist inclination, then the church would also be a fascist, fascist church, which could happen. So it's a, it's a vulnerable system, but it's also democratic. Yeah, I think um, Mike, uh, Mike Wiltridge has a, has a question for you. Um, if he's around, Mike, are you there? I mean, obviously. Yes, I am, I hope. Um, switched off, that's off, your video is off. That's all. Ah, right, put the microphone up, I'll put the video on as well then if you want it. Um, it was to ask how widely this uh, spiritual aspect of forest life seems to be shared by the immigrant population in Sweden. Um, this is, uh, so if you look at the demographics of who visit uh, the forest, who visits national parks, who go to this uh, recreational forest, uh, one of the most, you can see this, the, the age uh, variety is much, it's big, it's almost all ages except young adults. There are slightly more women than men, but almost the same amount of women and men. But the most clear difference is that most of them, the vast majority, have Swedish-born parents. So it's uh, uh, the immigrants will not come to the forest in the same extent. And if they do, they will come to the parking lots and there will be a park. Usually there are, because the, uh, you know, it, they're quite accessible, these forest areas. So there will be a parking lot and there will be some, you know, you can go to the bathroom and then maybe there's a cafe and there will be a, uh, some grass lawn there where you can uh, play some soccer before you go into the forest. Immigrants, if they come, not, there are exceptions, of course, but most of them, they will come to the parking lot and they will picnic on the grass lawn, but they will not go into the forest. Yeah. And if you ask them about it, they will say they think it's dangerous or they didn't know that they could do it. And this whole idea of, uh, we have this thing called the right of public access. It's like a custom that everyone has the right to go out everywhere in the forest and you can pick the berries and no landowner can come and say that you cannot pick the berries here. It's like Everyone has the right to the forest. This is the rule. You cannot come 100 meters within someone's private house, but everywhere else. And this is not something that exists all over, the, all over the world, of course. So people don't think they have the right. And when they do, uh, I generalize a little bit, but this is the general picture. And I've interviewed sort of forest uh, national park workers about this. When they do, they behave in, in ways that are strange to the Swedes. And this I've seen myself. For instance, they might bring music. Uh, and this is uh, a sacrilege. <laughs> you cannot bring music. When you go into the forest, you have to sort of quiet down and walk silently, sort of in a sort of a, almost like some kind of, you have to be quiet under the trees and very vigilant. You have to have this vigilant, uh, serene feeling about walking under the trees. And even I have this, I have the example in the book, I was visiting uh, Kiveden, which is a beautiful forest in central Sweden with some international colleagues. And we came there and we were talking on the parking lot and then we walked into the forest. And me and the other Swedes and the Estonians, because Estonians have very much the same culture around this, we sort of quieted down like this and just walked into the forest. But then the others, Germans and Italians, they just <laughs> spoke, you know, kept on talking as if they didn't realize that they had entered a temple, which was very annoying for the Estonians and us. That's fascinating. So there are differences. No, it's fascinating. Do you see that um, culture changing at all as time goes on? Yes, I think so. I mean, the, um, there are, it's almost a bit funny. There are, because among uh, some majority Swedish, uh, so ethnic Swedish uh, Swedes, there is this idea that forest is sort of, by itself a, a place that heals people and give, gives you peace and everything. It's, there's very much, from my perspective, the Swedes have been socialized. This is a culture. We've been socialized into having this relation to the forest. 
So it's not sort of the objective quality of the spruce trees that creates this calmness. It's something that it's going to the forest is like going to your grandmother's cottage where you had a nice childhood and you will feel safe when you come to that cottage because you had that childhood there. It's not the actual, you know, tablecloth of your grandmother's kitchen that creates this calmness. It's, it's your memories related to them. Uh, but sometimes Swede, Swedish authorities think that the forest has this, it's almost like a biological effect on people. So there was this story of some Afghan young uh, men who were refugees who had come to Sweden and they had, you know, they had been walking from Afghanistan through Iran all the way up to Sweden. And then they did something good for the community. And the reward they got was to go out and, and stay in tents for three nights by this, <laughs> by this rainy lake on the Swedish countryside. And they were like, what, why do we, do we get this punishment? <laughs> do we have to stay here in some tent again? Uh, so, of course, there's sometimes, uh, yeah, people can be a bit blind about the cultural aspect of uh, the forest. Okay, we have we have another another unswedish person here with a question. It's Claire Devon <laughs> coming in with a with a with a question about the wilderness. Hi, sorry. Can I hang on? Can I see myself? Yes. Yeah, you're can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Japan has a tradition that maybe something a little bit similar called forest bathing. It's become quite popular. Um, with a book recently published in English, Shinrin Yoku. Have you explored the any of the overlaps between those traditions? Is that something you've encountered? Yes. Perhaps explain your, your knowledge of Japan. I... Yeah, no, I lived in Japan for about 20 years and worked for a religious um, <sighs> So it's Center for the Study of Japanese Religions for a few of them. Okay. Yes, uh, this Shinrin Yoku, it's, uh, it's like a growing thing also in Sweden. And uh, in this, I wrote this book as a part of a research project. And one of the PhD students, uh, Henrik Olsson, who is working in this uh, research project, he's writing his doctoral thesis actually about uh, Shinrin Yoku in Sweden and this uh, therapeutic nature contact movement, which has in of which uh, Shinrin Yoku is one expression. Yes, uh, it's there, and it's very much sort of a hardcore version of what I have written about as a part of a more general culture. And it's um, um, it's growing, and it's people are interested. So there have been so many articles all over about this, and it sort of seems to touch something. Yeah, this is this must be something for me, kind of feeling. And one of the interesting things with that movement, and which also connects to the nature, uh, the general sort of turn to nature, spirituality, is uh, the demographic uh, sort of uh, setup of the people who attend Shinrin Yoku events. Because it is, as is the case with most religion and culture, uh, extremely women dominated. So it's almost only women, and it's almost only women uh, in a certain age, like 45 plus. Uh, and this says something because it's connected. And uh, Henrik Olsson will write uh, interestingly about this in his thesis, which will come two years from now or something. Uh, but the interesting thing there is that uh, there is a connection. So th these people, these women, they have been had, had their careers, they've been working hard. And then they have often, there is a story of having come to some kind of a burnout situation. You you sort of lose your energy and you feel sort of uh, uh, you don't have any the energy to keep on working in the type of society that they've been working on. They are burnt out and many have sort of episodes of uh, sick leaves or stress related uh, disorders of different kinds. And then you need to take care of yourself and you need to take care of uh, uh, you need to find a different way of living and relating to your near ones and your life and to, to a different type of life entirely. And that also connects to a more general sort of ideological critique of the structure of society and sort of the, the wheels just spinning faster and faster and all this competition and this uh, ma maximizing uh, uh, growth all the time. So there is a connectedness between individual stories of being burnt out 
and an ideological critique and a turning to a different type of uh, spirituality. Uh, so there's an interesting connectedness there. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing you said that the, the, the Shinriku things are uh, overwhelmingly women over 45. Um, but this isn't true of the general forest mysticism, is it? That's one of the things that interests me about what you write about in your book is that it is not actually um, particularly slanted towards women or indeed towards middle-aged people. It is something that everybody does. Yes, it is slightly, I think, tilted towards uh, a little bit older people. They're really young, maybe they're, they're too busy doing other things. But uh, it's very... Same, it's almost the same amount of men and women. There is a slight difference. If you look at the surveys that have been done, there is a slight gender difference in one, only when it comes to one particular question and or one particular sort of thing. And that is the relation between uh, getting a spiritual or existential experience, to what extent that connects to the wilderness of the nature. So for men, it's more, it's more important, the wilder it is, the more existential it gets. <laughs> this is true for the men, but not for the women. So, uh, so I suppose there's this, um, uh, men, the men have a little bit more of this exploring the wild, conquering the, the you know, the, the wasteland. Uh, and that there's some kind of existential dimension to that that the women don't have in as large an extent, at least. And of course, this, this fits very nicely because I make a big uh, deal of connecting this to a romantic nature, mm -hmm. nature romanticism in different versions that it, as it was formulated in the late 19th century and how it became a part of Swedish nationalism and in a very thorough way incorporated with this narrative of Swedishness, uh, the Swedes as a nature-loving people, for instance, was like a, 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 a saying that, that was there in the 1920s and the 30s and the 40s. And after the World War, it continued, but in a more slightly more um, social democratic, uh, egalitarian kind of way. But it's really been there all along. And if you grew up in Sweden, if you've grown up in Sweden, and if you've gone to Swedish kindergarten and Swedish primary schools and read Swedish children literatures and literature and watched movies and listened to music, you will be completely socialized into this idea of the forest as a caring and loving and uh, important place worthy of protection that is a part of our identity and what we are. So it's, it's really a part of our national narrative. Uh, which you can't escape. So Claire, Claire was raising her hand again, and Ruth also, but Claire. Okay. No. Several summers, I've been walking sections of the Kungsleden, the um, hiking trail in the very far north of Sweden, which is really quite emblematic of um, yeah. the the national. Um, love of nature, if you like. And one of the things I noticed the last time we walked was the furthest north section. There are meditation platforms set up at regular intervals along the trail. And that seems to fit in exactly with what you're saying. It's almost institutionalized. This is a place where you come into the wilderness. You walk this beautiful path through these wonderful yeah. wild mountains. And on the way, you have a place actually set for you by the tourist authority to sit and meditate. Yeah. I mean, that was really quite impressive for me. Yeah. yeah it really fits this whole theme. And, and one should remember, there are two things with, with Kungsleden. One is that they are national parks. And I just, I just want to make this note that they are called national parks, not nature parks, which shows to the connection between this, and this is true, of other countries as well, but the connection between these wild nature and the nation. It's, it's a nation, it's not nature, it's the nation that is the important thing of protecting some areas like this. Uh, also, one should remember, because it's easy to think of the Swedes as a nature-loving people, 
and they have this self-image and you find places like this if you walk in the mountains and there are all kinds of recreational forests all over the place and it seems very nature oriented but there are only about five percent of the swedish forest which is protected uh, and which people visit and they will see this beautiful protected authentic places the rest of it is uh, had been harvested in industrial forest industry uh, where they have systematically uh, sort of uh, killed all the other species except the spruce or pine trees that are there for uh, for economic growth growth so in one sense it's a nature loving people in another sense uh, the swedes we have treated our forest quite terribly actually and the par uh, and the paradox is that that exploit exploiting of the forest with monocultural pine tree uh, plantations covering the whole country that has created the wealth that has created this urban uh, affluent bourgeois culture where you can have this romantic nature love for the forest so there's this <laughs> really annoying connection between the forest love the bourgeois romantic forest love and the actual exploitation of the real forest and the other species so we mustn't be too proud of ourselves when we talk about these things yeah i mean you were actually spraying the forests with agent orange when i did yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you can still see the uh, the the results of that in some parts of the forest. We call it hormoslyr in Sweden was the name of it, but it was the same uh, chemicals as Agent Orange, which was used in, in the Vietnam War to, to yeah. keep the forest there. Okay, and as as we draw to the end, and with enormous gratitude, because I know it's extremely difficult to do prolonged interviews in a foreign language, but um, Ruth has a question. Well, any if there was time, I just wonder if there's any attempt to codify this feeling of reference to nature, because you seem to be describing something that's kind of innate that uh, people grow up with, that they are inculcated with from from birth in Sweden. But over here, you know, we've got the Association for Creation Spirituality. We have attempts to codify it in some way. Um, is there an well, attempt to do that, or is it just left loose as the feeling? What do you mean codify it to uh, pin it down in a specific vocabulary or language or organization? Or? Yes, I mean, we've we've had on calls before, um, for example, um, druids and pagans and, yeah, yes. uh, and uh, witches. Um, yes. And um, and there's an attempt there to create some kind of organization and, and code around a belief. And I'm just wondering if yeah. that's going on. Yes, well, there are such things. There are uh, different types of movements. Shinrin Yoku and that type would be one example of that. There are also different types of pagan organizations, something called Ludin, the, this type of neo pagan or, or sort of. Uh, uh, there are Wicca and similar uh, movements also. But for the vast majority, there is this problem of silence, which I sort of talked about in the beginning of this session. that we have this problem, the majority has a problem with language. So when I've interviewed people about this, and if I, for instance, someone tell me how they go out in the forest and they cry and they sit there and feel the unity of the universe. And then I say, ask in the interview, would you say that this is spiritual? Uh, some people, the, many of them react like this. No, no, don't come here now and, you know, pollute this with some kind of mambo jumbo religious words. This is my feeling. I don't want to be a part of something else. So there's, we have this sensitivity to being boxed into too much religious language. And I'll tell you one story. I've interviewed this uh, 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 nature guide or whatever would be the name. So someone who takes groups into the national park to show them the, the scenery and the different species and everything. And these nature guides, they really want, they see it as their their professional sort of job to give people this sense of connection with the wild. This is what they want to do. And not just uh, information about species, but a deeper existential sense of connection. But uh, they tell me that it's impossible to do this by means of language. Because if you start to say something like, oh, can you feel your spirit connect or something like this? It would just ruin everything immediately. So the only thing they can do is that they make sure that they put in long segments of 
silence when they walk in the forest. So they will come to one place and they will speak about biological information about some beetle or something. And then they would go to the next, talk about some rabbits or some trees. And then they will walk in silence for 25 minutes in some hard trail so that people cannot talk because they have to concentrate. And then they can just hope that they will get a little bit of this deeper nature connection through the silence because we don't have access to that language. Uh, I had a Shinrin-yoku uh, instructor that I interviewed who said that when she took her Shinrin-yoku um, course to become this uh, uh, teacher in this or uh, therapist, whatever called nature guide that, in Shinrin-yoku, the other uh, students came from other countries and they had one test where they asked people, uh, they had to do this uh, forest walk with some uh, Shinrin-yoku uh, participants and afterwards they were supposed to interview them. And the span in, in Spain, the people who had been doing Shinun Yoko, they could talk for like 45 minutes about their experience and it was so and that and this and that. And the Americans were the same. And, uh, and then when they asked the Swedish participants, they could only say like, it was nice. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the only thing they had because they don't want to soil it with too much speaking. 